Um, hi there, I'm Danny Henderson. Welcome back to my beautiful channel. Today, I am so happy to bring you again my good friend of 20 years, Dr. Manjir Samantha Lawton. Welcome, Dr. Manjir. How are you? Good to see you, Danny. <laughs> Um, I saw you last week in Milton Keynes at the Alternative View conference. Um, you did a fantastic job, of course. I was in the front row. <laughs> Cheerleading. <laughs> woohoo, woohoo, Dr. Manchair. So great. And I said to you, girl, you've got to come back on my channel. You've got to do the same presentation so we can bring the beautiful viewers that will see this um, up to date. Because as I was telling you, I'm seeing a lot of different people now looking for their place in the open platforms on the world. This disclosure is becoming so prolific um, and they're jumping on the black hole theories. And I'm like, no one's heard the theory from Dr. Manjir Samantha Lawton. So I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it. You're, you're going to bring it. But darling, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, let you start your beautiful discussion and presentation. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much for um, bringing me on today. And also we've spoken, but I've never really had the slides and shared the screen before, have, it, have I? So like we've never done that. So I thought today we would, as you requested, we'd go through exactly the same presentation that we did. And thank you so much for the support in that. And um, I have a keynote to share. I'm going to be able to share the sound as well. Right. Okay. So can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So if I just go through the slides like this, or should I put it on full slide? What What would you prefer? The full? It's probably better on full screen. Yeah. Full screen. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to lose seeing you. Yeah. Um, okay. But okay. Right. Okay, so um, this is a presentation. So talking about space weather and the fossil fuel fallacy. So the black hole principle, which is a theory that I've now been talking about for, oh my God, do you know, Danny, it's been 25 years since I started talking about the science of spirituality. Good Lord. And it's like actually quarter of a century. And the first talk that I did was actually after I was on call as a doctor overnight and I went down to London and did, I did my first ever presentation on quantum physics. <laughs> so it's been 25 years. So, um, and it's grown since then. So this is where uh, the black hole principle has got you today. And um, so how does it relate to space weather, fossil fuels, where we're going to find out? So, yeah, this is what we're going to be looking at. And traditional picture of black holes, um, the black hole principle, what I call the black hole principle, and why it absolutely changes everything that you thought about the universe. Um, black holes and water, the fossil fuel fallacy. I know, I know your audience are already questioning the sort of um, climate change narrative that's been pushed on us. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that in a deeper way and how this can help us as well. So the traditional picture of black holes, as you probably know, is that they are great guzzling monsters that um, suck in everything around them. And uh, so you're often the heroes of the sci-fi sci films, aren't they, where everything's like getting sucked in and, um, you know, they're rescued at the last minute. And they come out, out of Einstein's theory of relativity, where space and time curves so much that it ends up, a star collapses in on itself at the end of its life. Back then, these were theoretical objects. Uh, we didn't really know if black holes actually existed. And if they existed, we thought that they were going to be rare. So this clip um, is, I'm not going to play it actually, Danny, because you're going to put this on YouTube, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, so this is a BBC clip, but in this clip, this is one of the astrophysicists who's saying that um, black holes we thought were going to be rare, but actually they are everywhere. And they found black holes towards the end of the 90s, early 2000s, basically at the centre of each one of the galaxies. And still, they couldn't figure out that black holes might have a different role in, in, in the galaxy, even though they're at the centre of every single one. So mm. that was the big discovery. I'm not going to play it because uh, I don't want your channel to get into trouble. <laughs> 
Um, but so back in 2003, I was reading all about the sort of changes in astrophysics. I was working as, um, yeah, I well, had been working as a doctor and for various reasons, everything became um, cleared up in my life, which Daniel Day is all about. <laughs> and for quite a while already, I'd had an interest in astrophysics, physics, and I was reading about it every spare moment I could as a junior doctor, which wasn't very few, many spare moments. Um, and uh, so I was looking at a New Scientist article about objects in space called microquasars, which are associated with black holes. And don't worry too much about the name quasar. This is all rubbish anyway. You know, they're all the same things, but um, they're named different things. Um, so these objects are called microquasars, so small quasars. And um, they're supposed to be associated with black holes. But for some reason, this article was saying they were giving out electrons at nearly the, the speed of light in narrow jets. Particles are positrons. So electrons are particles of matter. They're subatomic particles below the atom. And then we've got particles of antimatter. So that's like the mirror image. And we're not supposed to have a lot of antimatter in the universe. So it's very interesting that they're giving off these particles of antimatter. So the mirror image of the normal matter that we experience in every day. Very interesting. And then at times, these microquasars were giving off gamma rays. So that is a form of light that's very, very high energy. And really the highest form of the electromagnetic spectrum that we know about. And it's also interesting because they are, the gamma rays, the end point of a positron and electron coming together. And in their, you know, the, science uses a lot of very violent terms. And in their terms, they annihilate each other. It's lovely, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Rather than merge or something like that, they annihilate each other. I'm and so, they exactly, they come together. And uh, so I was out in the woods with my dog who you remember, probably Jenny. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. Yeah. And um, I sat on a branch of a tree and I wanted to feel the rotation of the planet because I remembered a video that my um old my healing teacher had told me, had shown me. And in it, Brian Swim was saying, we never look at the, uh, we never stop to feel the rotation of the earth. And I sat on the branch of an oak tree and decided to go, and feel the rotation of the earth and in a splash second suddenly this whole load of information just downloaded into me and I was in the black hole as it were like it wasn't just like a vision like I could see something in front of me and I realized that we've got it completely wrong and for the last 20 years I've been researching and making sure that all the astrophysics data lines up with that vision and this is something I've got a very simple diagram just called the black hole principle and this diagram is simple on purpose so that you can really see the simplicity of it so at the center of the black hole is still that singularity that infinity and then the light spirals from higher dimensions and gets to the edge of our reality which i've renamed from the event horizon to the perception horizon because beyond it we're not perceiving that's like um the dark energy and the dark matter that scientists don't know what it is and they don't know how to measure it and it gets the edge of our reality and it splits into the antimatter and matter, so the positron and the electron. And that's why we see these electrons coming out of black holes at almost light speed, because they've only just slowed down to this dimension. And they also have a an antimatter pair. So that's the spiral of light. And it doesn't just end there, because now we've got a little... um film that we can actually show this so it spirals from infinity to the edge of the perception horizon they split but then they combine again and in a sort of breathing process I also realize this is happening at every single level of the universe so we'll go into that in a second so that was the big insight and um I um 
you know, re- I've been basically studying this for 20 years and just looking at all the data. Now, what they're doing at the moment is they've got all these fancy telescopes and they're finding things and they're finding things. And they, th- these things they're finding don't fit with the theories that they've got. But instead of changing the theories, they just go, well, we need, we need more telescopes. And this should bother you because this is our tax money that's going into creating these telescopes. Um, so if all they're doing is going, well, we need more money to create another one, and we need more money to create another and not looking at what they're getting and going, maybe we got it all wrong, um, then it's quite a serious matter for all of us, actually. So um, what the black hole principle is saying is that the speed of light at the edge of a black hole, we see that split, and that's why we have these jets that are at almost light speed. Um and then the two combine, and that's what forms these gamma ray bursts, these really high energy light that um we can see all over the cosmos. And it's a type of sort of breathing process. And it happens at every level of the universe. So the particles might differ at the levels that they are. And um, so you know, it's even a form of it is even happening inside our atoms as well. Um, so you know, and the energies may differ. So that's the uh, process in a nutshell. And uh, this is the sort of cycle that's happening, the particle of antimatter and matter combining to the photon and cycling. Now, in ancient um, traditions, we know about the dance of Shiva, the flow of the Tao. You know, the, the change is the only constant. And I think those people knew deep into the universe that there's no set point. There's just movement. There's just the dance. And this dance is happening all the time. So the photon is not the end point. You know, the the two particles are not the end point. It's the dance that is the point. It's the movement that never stops. So, um, you know, so ancient knowledge knew about this. Now, the way that the black hole principle manifests is as these, but often as these bipolar jets. You can sometimes see spiral geometry in these as well. And so these are real images taken from space, from space telescopes. And you can see these like, um, you know, the jets are at 180 degrees to each other. Now, if really, if their theory is correct that everything is, going down the plug hole, then the accretion disk, as it's called, you know, the stuff that it's pulling in, they're saying it gets really, really superheated and it gives off these jets as they're going in the plug hole. Why they would do that is not really clear, according to them, but this is what they're saying. But the actual mathematics and geometry of that doesn't work because why would it be at 180? It should really look like if you've ever seen a Catherine wheel, uh, Catherine wheel the firework and the fireworks go round and the, the sparks come off it don't they radially mm-hmm. you know so that's what it would look like if it's um if it's really that so this is some of the manifest- manifestations so this is around a, a actual galaxies so you can see that's a Hubble telescope so that's what we're looking for we're looking for this sign which is bipolar jets of the black hole principle activity of creation. So we now understand they're not destructive, they're creative. So this is one of the things that really got me going because I realized that antimatter had been found pouring out of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, back in 1997. So um, I was going, gosh, this is real. And that's what really got me going, okay, yeah, there's, there's something happening here. And Sir Martin Rees, in that, who used to be the Astronomer Royal, basically said the same thing. He said black holes of different masses behave in the same way. It just scales up and down. Um, so, yeah, I have actually met that guy, but <laughs> never mind. Um, <laughs> so this is what we should be finding. Um, bipolar concentrated jets, like evidence of spiral geometry at times, and fluctuating unpredictable emissions. Now, do you remember those things called pulsars that people are saying, oh, you know, those are, you know, um, they're always giving off pulses. Mm. These things are actually all the same process. They're just named different things. So we see the fluctuations and we go, oh, we'll name that this. Oh, we'll name that quasars. Oh, we'll name that. They're all the same thing. 
you know, but they're just named after the emissions that we're, they're giving off. So sometimes those can be days, hours, or even years. And if you look, I've actually done a blog called The Supernova That Refuses to Die. And that was a star that was supposed to have exploded in the 1950s. And yet years later, we now see signals coming from that same place because they've misdiagnosed what a supernova is. It's just a really big black hole emission. And there's it's just coming from that. And so, of course, it can come back again. So, um, so we're misdiagnosing all these things like supernovas as explosions and collisions and all that kind of sorry to say but the you know the, the macho stuff <laughs> and it's a very violent universe according to these astrophysicists but it doesn't have to be we're talking about something that is a gentle process of infinite power but ease as well so it's a, it's an unfolding of the universe that is powerful but effortless so and in that we also see movement faster than expected so almost at light speed because if you remember it's just got to below the speed of light and there'll be several types of emissions i haven't gone into all of them here because it's just too much but you do get microwaves radio waves depending on the level depending on the fluctuations that's happening and evidence of new creations sometimes seen so you can see new stars that are near the galactic center and you'll see presence of gamma rays antimatter and uh, usually electrons near light speed. So this is another example. This is actually a star. So this is not a galaxy. This is actually a star, and it's got the bipolar jets. This is a planet which has bipolar jets. So you're seeing it at every single level, and you can see that they're puzzled about it, and it poses a mystery. And, uh, you know, the sun gives off antimatter particles, and x-ray flares so you you've seen these solar um the solar releases that we see um these solar flares and you know all of these things that are coming off the sun they actually fit this image as well they've got the x-rays x-rays come from high energy electrons so that's where that's coming from um so it fits that kind of pattern so um and even comets comets we've been led to believe are like these dirty snowballs do, do you remember hearing about that danny yes <laughs> how rude so um if they really were just dirty snowballs then when they came ne come near the sun and expect them just to melt in a huge almost like a sheet you know but they don't they give off fine jets because they're also these black hole principle bodies. And I was actually in this um, meeting with a load of astrophysicists when they were discussing the asteroid Bennu. And they were going, well, we found that it kind of gives off these ejections and we don't know why. And they were going, we, we're checking that it's not being hit by something. We're checking that... And they have no idea why something as small as an asteroid is giving off these periodic ejections. So even something like that. And even at the atomic and quark level, you're seeing these bipolar jets, these two jets. So this has been found in particle colliders. And as I said, if you don't understand how to interpret the big picture of this, what are you going to do when you find something like that? Ask for more money from the taxpayer to build yet another particle collider. So the fact that they're not interpreting this correctly involves all of us because they just keep going asking for more money for better equipment. So as I'm showing you, they still don't know why black holes produce these jets. Um, and you can, this is an illustration, but you can beautifully see the spiral. And even the black hole that was pictured in 2019, was it? Um, that was imaged, um, that also has jets. It had jets when they found it, but they just left it off the story because they didn't want to um, complicate things. And uh, if you see the announcement, the European announcement, he actually says we go past, we're going past these jets. It's like jets. Why are there jets coming out of a black hole then if it's gobbling everything up? And uh, since then, it's giving off more jets. And so even one of the most famous black holes in the world um, is giving off jets. And they don't understand why. 
we've got this breathing process to remember that recombination and it produces the um, particle of light as well it's breathing you actually see that breathing in clouds that are near the milky way um this is again from a scientific um uh publication i think this is scientific american a growing breathing galaxy so you can see that the galaxy itself is actually breathing so these jets massive surprise when they took a gamma ray telescope and they looked at our own milky way they found these big bubbles and they were like oh what are these all about these are gamma ray bubbles so they were like quite astonished and when they did a further resolution on the picture guess what they found these jets um now a child could see that these jets are actually um going round in a um it, like in a spiral basically they're spiraling around and they're actually creating these bubbles um but guess what the astrophysicists don't see that and they're wondering oh what what's what's what what's this what's going on so again it's around our own milky way and the explanation is that um the black hole is burping so their conception is that basically the black hole is taking things in they can't conceive that it's actually creating and it's actually um burping out the food that it's ingesting oh, and uh it's taking <laughs> no it's just crazy and it's giving off these gamma rays and then as a sort of after burp it's giving off x-rays instead of realizing that they are just this fluctuation that's actually coming from um the black hole itself because it's coming from higher dimensions they can't conceive of that anything is other than material reality so their consciousness stops there, basically. And just to say, even their own data shows that this isn't the case, because instead of being like explosions, it's actually fluctuating. You get gamma rays and x-rays and gamma rays and x-rays, but they don't want to see that it doesn't fit the picture. Um, so does the Earth actually show these um, behaviours as well? Well, you know, the data that we have from the centre of the Earth, because... We know very, very little actually from what is beneath our feet, what is actually in the Earth's interior. People keep saying it's an iron molten core that fluctuates and that causes the Van Allen belts and things like that to fluctuate. Um, but the magnetic fields around the Earth to fluctuate. Um, but actually, we have no evidence of that. Mm. No evidence. And so when we actually look into the Earth's core, what do we find? We find antimatter. So the Earth itself is giving off antimatter. Um, okay. Um, so I'm not going to play this video, but um, the other, I mean, we've been talking about auroras a lot recently. Some of the auroras are actually interacting with the sun, um, the particles from the sun. Um, but there's actually a clip here um, which shows that the um, aurora borealis and the aurora, aurora australis on the other sides of the planet happen at the same time. It's effectively a bipolar jet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what some of the auroras are to do with. And this one is a picture of the Van Allen belt that is changing. So do you remember I said you will see fluctuations? So sometimes there are three rings, sometimes there are two rings. So this is what's happening. You're seeing these fluctuating um uh particles sorry i'm not going to play that because i don't want to get your challenge to trouble and um so these are so one of the like most um like interesting and intriguing ways that the black hole principle shows up on the planet and you probably you know this already that it's everything that i've said clear so far danny yes just checking in with you yep. okay brilliant so one of the um most interesting way that really gets people excited is um these things called terrestrial gamma ray flashes um so where do we find those well when we started in the satellite era um we actually could look above the earth into the upper earth's upper atmosphere and what we found is looking back at the earth with gamma ray telescopes and things that there are loads of these gamma ray Bursts of the same sort of energy that you find out in space, but they call them something different because they don't want to 
you know, make that connection. And they call them terrestrial gamma ray flashes or TGFs for short. And uh, so and and so they found this. This is a complete and utter shock. And they're finding these blue jets and things like that. Um, so this is a shock. They weren't expecting to see these at all. And so I started to realise, oh, my goodness, thunderstorms are basically mini black holes um, because they've got gamma ray flashes. And if that's and they've got fast moving electrons as well. So what are the fast moving electrons? Lightning. Mm -hmm. So that's the word that we often use for the fast moving electrons. When a lightning flash hits the Earth, it's about a third the speed of light. It's going very, very, very fast. Um, so we have those two elements. And it was like, OK, so if these really are black holes, then we'd expect to see some antimatter as well. So this is the uh, conventional explanation for um, lightning, how it's taught in schools. It's wrong, but we're taught that it's static electricity, a bit like how you rub your um, a balloon on your hair and it causes discharge and you know, and it'll come down to the planet, you know, the lightning will come down just like a, a balloon will cause the static and, you know, or a, a Van de Graaff generator causing a spark. And uh, that's the explanation that is still taught today in schools. Um, but the only trouble is, uh, the this is what we do in science. We disprove things. Um, this mechanism has been disproved long ago. Um, there's not nearly enough voltage that builds up in a cloud to produce lightning like this. And um, so there it goes. You know, obviously, there's not nearly enough. So the question remains, how is lightning formed? Just on this planet right now, there are so many lightning discharges as we're speaking. It's one of the most common phenomena on the planet. And yet we don't know how it happens. And you can see on the um, the other side, you, we can also see bipolar events in uh, thunderstorms. So absolutely amazing. So it goes more towards the black hole principle than it does their theories. Their theory has actually been disproved, but they still tell it to little kids because they've got nothing else. And they don't want to admit that they don't know what's going on. So that's a lot of science as well, just saving yourself from embarrassment. Um, so. As I said, in 2006, I published the book Punk Science saying we should have antimatter in thunderstorms. And in 2011, NASA found antimatter in thunderstorms. So um, antimatter particle beams. And the irony is that people saying, we know indeed how black holes work at the centre of distant galaxies, but we don't know what's going over our heads. Yeah, right. OK, you don't know either. So basically, they're the same mechanism. The thunderstorms are the mini black holes. So I started to thinking, well, what else happens in thunderstorms? Rain. So does water come from black holes, that means? If I was right, we would find water all over space. And we do indeed find that. And so... um. What I didn't realise as well is that meteorologists don't actually know why it rains. That I mean, these are like mega, mega secrets that people keep back, you know. So um, they don't actually know why clouds rain. Isn't that interesting? And you can actually see, um, have you ever been to the beach and you see like, um, you know, the sea is just there, isn't it? And you, you won't have a cloud in the sky. How is that possible if what we're taught is that you have the hydrological cycle and you do this and, you, you know, the clouds come in and then some some sometimes you've got a cloudy sky and no rain. So what's all that about? So um, the meteorologists don't know. They're just fudging things. So, as I said, I realise that black holes must produce water and that's exactly what the scientists have found. And this is around 2011. Um, so black holes spewing water vapour, black holes, galactic geysers coming out of black holes. Um, and huge, a huge reservoir of water has been discovered in space. You know, 100,000 times more massive than the sun. That's just like amazing. Again, associated with the black hole. 
So we now know, I mean, you probably have seen it because you've um, seen the headlines, but there's like water ice being found on moons, um, on the moons in the North Pole. Interestingly, you often find them in craters. So what I'm saying is actually craters are not impact craters, they're upwelling. So as they um, are upwelling, they sometimes puncture the surface of something. And in the middle of the crater, you'll find uh, water and other things. We'll come on to that. This is Enceladus down here. That is um, uh, one of uh, Saturn's moons. Oh, sorry. That's one of Saturn's moons. And um, it actually was a complete shock. We're about to just go to Saturn. And suddenly this tiny little moon is giving off these jets of water. Completely unexpected. Um, you know, there's uh, Jupiter's moon Europa and comets as well. Comets are giving off jets of water from the centre. Do you see that? Um, so... Yeah, and then the water on Mars was found in 2015. And the point is that it's continuously created. They weren't sure if was, this is water that was a residue for something or if it's continuously created. And they discovered it was continuously created. And the quote is, we don't know where it's coming from. These things have been created from a black hole principle um, behavior from not just the interior of these bodies like planets and stars but they're actually being created from um and moons and things but they're actually being created from every level as well and we can see that really easily on the earth where we have geysers geysers you know there are jets of water water spouts all these things that is not just one place that's producing um water so again like i've just said amazingly sunspots on our very sun produce water yeah. i mean this has been known about for years but you know we don't talk about it and um yeah but we're finding more and more so this is a young star so-called young star um with uh you know polar jets which are giving off water star found shooting water bullets it these things are just put out there and then nobody makes a comment this is just recently, this is just this year, baby stars, planet forming disk has three times more water than all Earth's oceans. Again, it's just put out there, no explanation. This was not predicted by the astrophysicists, this is, but this fits in if everything from thunderstorms to a um, galactic black hole is the same mechanism, just at different levels, all giving off water. So again, uh, volcanic eruptions, um, which happen all over the solar system as well, we can see. Um, actually, when you look at the um, geologists and people, they say, we don't know the basics behind a volcanic eruption. And, you know, we're finding things like ice volcanoes on Pluto, on dwarf planet Ceres, which is a tiny sort of dwarf planet. And um, so you've got ice volcanoes that are actually erupting water and ice. Um, so you can see that on Pluto, um, a volcanic comet, amazingly. This is all, you know, fairly recent um, findings, not expected at all from the astrophysics perspective. So the Earth, is that also um, producing its own water? Well, absolutely. And this has been a controversy for many years. That, you know, at the top I've shown a comet hitting the planet. That's how it's, we're told water got to Earth, but people don't really know and that we're recycling the water ever since. And aren't we always told that the water's running out? We haven't got water, enough water for everyone. I stood up in California in 2013 and said, the water is coming from the Earth's core. And within a few months, a massive ocean was discovered towards the Earth's core, mm. wrapped up in some um, rock. And uh, so that was a really, <laughs> a really quick one. So uh, since then, I've met a number, I've come across a number of scientists, both living and past, who um, have been talking about primal water, primary water, for over a hundred years. And there's actually an Australian um, uh, guy called Dr. Robert Grillet, who writes for Nexus. So if you, he talks about earth generated water and these people actually have been going around by discovering water wells for people, for communities who need it. Stephen Reese 
um, who died um, many years ago, but he was a miner who realised that the water that was coming out of mines periodically and flooding the mines was a different quality to rainwater. And that's when he started to realise this is different. This is coming up from the earth, not down. And uh, he discovered over 800 wells in his lifetime, including the Californian Water Board, who um, he was an Austrian um, scientist. And he actually, they took the water, but they didn't take the, the explanation that he gave, which is it's generated by the earth itself. So the key to finding these wells is gamma radiation. So they look for the gamma radiation. So it's all fitting together. So I've had some conversations with Robert Gourlay and um, basically I'm doing the, it's like proving what they're doing from space perspective, which they've never thought about. And, um, but it's all sort of coming together now so that we can see a big picture that it's not just about the earth generating water, it's all bodies are generating water of how the capability but we still teach this sort of stuff in school, the hydrological cycle, that we're just recycling um, the same water and over and over again. Um, we've all tasted black hole water. And if you have ever looked at the side of one of your mineral water sort of bottles, it'll show water shooting straight up somehow, you know, just by itself um, going against gravity and going up to the top of a mountain. These are the jets that we're talking about. The reason why they can get up to the top of mountains is because they're jetting up there and they're being produced by little black holes at every single level. So you've tasted it. It's called Devian. It's called whatever brand you you go. And, you know, when we have like um, uh, water from volcanoes, this is like an earthquake. You can see the amount of water that comes out. Mm. This is old footage, but there's new footage as well. And the main uh, gas from a volcano is actually water vapor. Mm. And um, so I'm just checking, are you um, happy with uh, everything that was saying so far? Yeah, it gives so much, um, you know, openness to discuss and discover and rethink everything that we've been told as truth from children to the present moment. I love that you bring in the upwelling leaving signature, physical signature marks on the Earth's surface as opposed to that wasn't a, a necessarily an impact from off planet, that was an upwelling from inside the planet. And it's beautiful to see the way that you put it together, that you reintroduce a new way of thinking, that you eliminate the uh, destructive um, violence that is, you know, we've been told is out there. And you just open up a whole different gamut um, you know, which is why we're having this conversation. And it's why we're friends, Dr. Manjir, honestly, because you've been focused and studying this for 25 years, as you shared. You were originally a medical doctor, a GP, working with children with cancer. You've done so many beautiful, crazy, beautiful, wonderful things in service to the earth, to humanity. And here you are leading edge and renaming uh, the theory of black hole as the black hole principle. We will talk about punk science, which is the word behind you there on your on your your backdrop. Uh, but no, so far, there we go. Punk science. That was something that you created that we're excited to share with the audience here, too. But no, this is perfect thus far. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, you know, wherever you go in the world, you can find stories of a great flood that happened. You know, if you look at the work of people like Graham Hancock, he's talking about like um, 10,000 years ago, that sort of time. And um, so, yeah, what happened then? And people say, oh, it's just local to Mesopotamia. No, it's not. You see these flood stories all over, over the world. And uh, so that could have been one massive release from the earth. And even if you look at the Bible, people say, well, it just, the flood was called by 40 days and 40 nights of rain. It actually talks about the earth opening up and, and water coming out. So it's it's even there in the Bible. So that could have been one big release for some reason. Um, in other talks, if you look at um online for my origins talk, I talk about the cycles of the planet and um how that's also a spiral and how um it's a change of consciousness that happens that releases the um the well just just even a change in the cycle of the earth um that. We, you know, there's this concept of the great year and everything. So when that got to a certain place, um, we the planet itself released some water. But um, yeah, but now we know where the water's coming from, and obviously this has huge implications for climate change as well. Um, if we can understand this better, 
And interestingly, you know, that we're constantly told that the science is certain on climate change. But just as recently as 2017, um, they found gamma ray, well, they actually were just turning their Fermi telescope onto the Earth. And guess what? Spotted gamma ray flashes in um in hurricanes. You know, tropical storms, hurricanes are called different things according to where on the planet they are. I've had to learn some of this climate meteorology stuff. And um, so they're just they're the same sort of mechanism. And, and what do they find? They find antimatter and gamma rays in uh, these uh, tropical storms, hurricanes. So if the science is so certain, why have we only just discovered this? And why was only one person, uh, as in me, um, actually predicted this because <laughs> it's the same process <laughs> that <laughs> a, a galactic black hole all the way down and um, I'm the only one that actually would have said yep that's exactly what we were expecting the actual scientists don't didn't know what was happening so this is to spell it out so it's the same process of creating gamma ray bursts electron discharge in TGFs, thunderstorms, you know, and many different levels, like weather systems, volcanoes, as well as in space. So it's all the same process, just different levels. And uh, there's more, though, because, <laughs> um, you know, I started to realise it also has implications for the, crea the creation process is um, coming from black holes, but it doesn't just produce water. Um, I believe it produces um, all the elements. And... There's a guy that's got, oh, I'm just forgetting his name. He was on the Joe Rogan show recently. I saw a snippet of him talking about the spiral of the periodic table. Yeah. The Walter Terrence, Russell's work. Terence Howard. Terence, that, uh... Terence Howard, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm so glad that this is getting out there. Um, this, you know, spiral of creation of all the elements. Um, so, you know, because it also has implications as to how we look at, um, you know, our lives in general, because we're taught this about fossil fuels, that um, this is a creation of fossil fuels, that there was these, you know, swampy kind of forests and over many, many millions of years, everything gets compressed and it turns into coal. And then we've got um, this, you know, oil is created by sea plankton. And, you know, somebody said the other day, um, melted dinosaurs, I think. Ooh. That's where we get um oil from. <laughs> Melted dinosaurs. And... Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> that is really quite funny. So that's the sort of perception. Now, interestingly, I don't know if you know this, but when you find oil, you find coal on top of it. Did you know that? And it's like the explanation, the conventional explanation is they slide onto each other. But then you find oil, coal, and then you find methane on top, and you also find helium, which is really interesting because helium is not used by um by living things. It's got no use for that. So it's very interesting that those are the layers. Um, but still we're told this story, even though the and we're just told well the, the layers just migrate to each other. It doesn't quite make sense. Um I was watching a um a documentary in the Gulf of Mexico about huge asteroid um, impact crater that's there. It's supposed to have wiped out the dinosaurs. And when I was watching it, um, I'll just put it on, but should we just... Um, asteroid I, impact I think in the okay Gulf of Mexico bit. could wipe out dinosaurs around that, the globe. Yeah. First, the entire Gulf must be drained away. As the water recedes, it reveals a vast continental shelf running around the coastline. The crumpled plain is thick with sediment, but the crater is still hidden under thousands of feet of rock. 66 million years of geology must now be rolled back, draining away layer upon layer of sedimentary rock until the impact site begins to emerge, a site that no living creature has witnessed for 66 million years. The crater is immense over half a mile deep and 120 miles wide. Around its edge towers the outer rim, formed by rock ejected from deep within the Earth's crust. That's the bit that got me. 
Um, so then if you can see they're draining away using obviously scanning techniques to actually discover what's under there. And this is the ast the huge asteroid that's supposed to have wiped out the dinosaurs. Strangely enough, there's no trace of the actual asteroid. So how can something we, we're expected to believe that something can make such a huge impact to wipe out dinosaurs, but there's no no trace of it whatsoever. No no burnt material, whatever. It both vaporizes on impact and makes that sort of impact. Mm -hmm. It it in nature things don't happen like that. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I always think back to um, the James Ossery, you know, the uh, the bone box that that supposedly houses the. That's another whole another story, but houses the. Um, the bones of Jesus's brother, supposedly. That, that's a whole story, but there was a trial to do with that because it's, it's people thought it might be fake, and they went into that trial and um, they found the traces of the cleaning fluid that the guy's mother had used to try and clean it back in the seventies. They found traces of that cleaning fluid. It's like things in nature, you can find traces of them, and yet we're supposed to believe that. So I realised that when the outer rim has got bits of the centre of the Earth, um, I thought this is an upward... This is not an impact crater. This is upwelling. It was a massive upwelling um, ejection from the central black hole of the Earth, effectively. And where there probably will be one at the other side of the planet as well, um, because of the bipolar jet. And we often get, don't we often get volcanoes and uh, earthquakes in pairs? Have you noticed that that we get a uh, cluster at once in yeah. different parts of the of the world? So um, when I realised that, and I thought, well, what is common in the Gulf of Mexico? And it's basically oil, what we call fossil fuels. And I started to think, well. If I'm right that this this is basically the, the creation process from the black hole principle of the Earth, then we should be able to find oil in space, if I'm right. And so it didn't take me very long to find that there's absolutely tons of oil in space. There's mm -hmm. crude oil on Mars, there's methane jets that are happening on Mars, uh, Titan, which is um, one of Saturn's moons, so much more, more oil than Earth, and they kind of like fudge it a bit. They go, oh, we're talking. Oh, yes, the hydrocarbons or complex hydrocarbons. They're they're either the same chemical composition or pretty, pretty, you know, pretty much um pretty similar. Um, so uh, amazing. It, it's all it's all carbon based at least. So um, what we've been told about fossil fuels is completely wrong. Um, and you can see these methane injections happening on very small planetoids in the Kuiper belt in the outer solar system that's just been found recently. So you can actually see um, grease, greasy molecules, carbonaceous molecules next to galactic centers. So it looks like they're coming straight out of galactic black holes. And scientists have also found a mega ocean of oil on the other side of the universe. And really amazingly, a researcher at Hong Kong has observed that coal and crude oil come out of stars and they're absolutely like flabbergasted. Like how do stars make such complicated organics under seemingly unfavorable conditions and do it so rapidly? So there's no trees on a star. There's no plankton on a star. So how are they able to do this? So it's an abiotic process, It's which means no biology. It's coming from the black hole itself at the centre of the um, the planets and the, 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 the stars, the bodies, and because it's all the same principle, the black hole principle. So this is... This is the sort of thing that you're seeing at the moment. You can see this is April 25th, 2024. So this is just, you know, um, not very long ago. So they're still trying to figure out why methane jets are coming out of Mars. And initially they thought that it was one of the um, the rovers, the, you know, the uh, little buggies they're putting on Mars to do things that were actually farting. And they still think that the methane that's called, that's coming out of the Earth is down to cows. I mean, it's just just amazing. It's just amazing. The so, biggest um, insult ever, Mangia. It's the biggest insult that we're so stupid that we're going to believe this because they've tried. They've got away with it, you know. Until women like you come along and stand up and say, "Stop, enough." 
here's what's exactly. going on. Until that happens, you exactly. know, they carry on lying to us. Exactly, exactly. And it's not just lying, it's also they want to restrict our lives. Um, so it's really important that we get to the truth. I'm not saying for a second that burning what quote unquote fossil fuels is what we need to carry on doing because there are other things that we get, other problems that we get from burning those. But you know, the fact is, um, what they're saying is not true, and the proof is that we're finding it all over space. So if they're really going to restrict our lives over this, we better know what it's all about. Um, so as I said, these are the um Kuiper Belt um methane jets, and the scientist has got the uh the truth to actually say that these are being continuously created. So at least that person is very honest and they're saying that. So that's just this year. Diamonds, which were told are uh, compressed coals all over space. It even rains diamonds on certain planets. Moon-sized diamond found in space. And even coming out of stars. Um, that one on the left there, there's um the Milky Way is strewn with diamonds. Um, so and on Earth itself, we see diamond coming out of things that are kimberlite pipes. Um, named after a town in South Africa called Kimberley, where they were found. And um, so this is what is coming out of the Earth. If you really want to see an interesting article on this new scientist, did a recent one called Diamond Geezers, which is quite a good title. But it's uh, G-E-Y-S-E-R-S, as in um, the uh, volcanic things that happen in um, Iceland. Um, so, yeah, um, they're puzzling as to where these come from, where diamonds come from. Um, so the, these are the jets. So this isn't completely new. Um, abiotic theories are uh, come out of Russia and they the Russian scientists know about it. What these people haven't connected with is that it's the same process all over space. And, um, you know, and it's happening at every single level. Um, but Thomas Gold is a physicist who, if you read that book, you can really see just how the fossil idea doesn't make any sense. And people who work in the oil industry actually say that. They know that um, these pump jacks that they get the um, oil out of the ground with, they put these oil wells fill up again. Mm. You know, it's flowing like black rivers beneath it. All we have to do is chase the current. There's lots of stories about this. And um, I don't know if I can play this as well, but this is a Pentagon, um, uh, someone who worked in the Pentagon explaining that um, basically it's down to Rockefeller deciding that they wanted to make it sound scarce. So they called it fossil fuels in order to make it more expensive. Um, I won't play it, Danny, because of the, um, yeah. uh, the, this is his name. You can actually go look, um, because, but because I, do, I just want to protect your YouTube channel. Um, so that was the Pentagon um, insider who spoke the truth. Um, so we're reframing fossil fuels. They, you know, they allow us to develop in a certain way, um, and it helps us to feel connection to the planet of the gifts that we are getting from this planet: the water, the um, the oil and coal that's allowed us to go through the industrial revolution. Whatever you think of that, it's allowed for some of our development feel gratitude for the past and we're able to move on if we want to, um, but understand what it truly is. Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> mm. That's uh, a topic you know about really, isn't it, Danny? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, does this black hole principle have implications for high levels, um, areas of high paranormal activity, such as Skinwalker Ranch? The reason why Skinwalker Ranch, I've chosen this is because of the TV show has meant that it's had quite extensive study that's been available through the show. Um, and uh, if you don't know what that is, it's a ranch in Utah that's had many sort of reports of um, UFOs, paranormal activity. And so the US government basically own it. I think they still own it now. It's supposed to be a different owner now, but it just all is... And um, on this uh, TV show, you've got like 
FBI agents and things like that, people who were coming in and uh, sort of studying this, um, this uh, astrophysicist as well. And uh, so, but they're putting it out to the public in terms of this TV show. And what are they finding? They're finding periodic gamma rays um, to the point where it actually injures somebody, uh, one of the scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so UAPs, UFOs, people who watch this, um, your channel know all about those. And actual jets that are seen from some of the areas of the Mesa. And um, there's an anomaly um, that's imaged at 5,000 feet. And it's actually a black hole with a, with a jet. And there's other things as well. The whole area has got oil, geothermal springs, something called gilsonite, which is that sort of coal-like subject. So um, if you can see, they just flashed this up very, very quickly. But this is what they found at 5,000 feet. It looks very much like a jet coming out of a black hole that just opened up in the, in the, um, in the air and then um, you know disappeared again. And they just caught that flash. That's the jet that they found with a certain type of, um, is it photogrammetry to call it? Um, and uh, also this is the Utah Basin at the top there in in um, in general where a lot of oil is found and that coal-like substance. And it's just, it's not too far from Yellowstone. Um, so, you know, you've got, whole, if you look at the whole sort of area, you've got geothermal springs, you've got even an area called um, something like the moon surface or something where it looks like a lunar landscape. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting area. So what I'm saying is this area and other areas like it are areas of high portal activity, effectively, where the dimensions are coming through because they are a surface black hole. So they've got the jets, they've got the gamma rays, they've got the um, electromagnetic um uh, frequencies and also because it's a portal to d different dimensions things are coming through mm -hmm. so you're getting the UF UAPs and things like that so we need to sort of you know um, revisit all that I did a whole presentation on that as well I probably will put that on to um, or just on Skinwalker probably put, will put that onto my YouTube channel uh, that's a punk science YouTube channel so effectively we've got one mechanism between Earth phenomena both in on Earth and actually out in space as well, volcanoes and everything is the black hole principle, just expressed at different levels. Um, the universe is just simple, and um, you know it's got a simple pattern creating infinite complexity. So once we know the underlying principle behind it, and I, I quite frankly, the Skinwalker Ranch was I started to think about it, and then somebody wrote to me and said, "Have you ever thought that?" You know, this came on around this black hole principle. And that's what I love about this. It's so simple that other people teach me and um, tell me examples that I might not have thought of. Like somebody came up to me and said, have you thought about birth? Because birth is a spiral as a baby comes out. It spirals, and then you have the release of water, and, you know, um, we, we actually talk about the waters breaking. Um, so, you know, th these are examples. So, yeah, how about the future then? We, you know, you can't understand climate change, for example. So all these sort of lockdowns are trying to do. If you don't understand climate, how can you understand climate change? Um, so antimatter and thunderstorms, gamma ray bursts and hurricanes, all these things, water from the centre of the earth, areas of, how, of high paranormal activity. We can start to look at this in a new framework, a new paradigm and study this further, wouldn't it be wonderful if we understood um, when the next volcano is happening, for example? Mm. So we may be able to evacuate people earlier. So there's, maybe we can do gamma ray studies on volcanoes, discover any patterns, you know, that might help us in future. Um, so, yeah, this is exactly what I'm saying. Um, deeper understanding, maybe get new energy sources through this. Um, maybe help with space space exploration, knowing that there's going to be sources of fossil fuels, um, on different bodies. Um, you know, Elon Musk's uh, obsessed with getting over to Mars. You know, and uh, yeah, that might help him. <laughs> and um, so understanding universe phenomena such as fast radio bursts, which I haven't talked about today, but you've got such um, you know, really really massive ejections of energy in a short period of time well if you've got infinity that it's coming from you can explain that you know yeah. if you're just thinking in a sort of 3d world way 
then it doesn't make any sense. So, um, yeah, it's got implications for the future. So, so um, oh, I was just going to, is it okay just to talk about if people want to know more and to join yeah. um, the club? I've done a special offer for your viewers and um, to apply all this stuff, to apply the Black Hole Principle and things to your own life and your own creativity if that's interesting and you're also going to get i've never offered this before a bonus of galactic activation and uh, so that is a short course just helping you get into the dimensions and everything in yourself and so i've created a short link and it's drmanjia.com forward slash danny is um and it's exactly as it's written there that will take you to the actual offer and if you want the information, go to drmanjia.com forward slash GA for galactic activation. And uh, you'll be able to um, see more about that. Um, so, yeah, just uh, put that together for your... Um, and then as that, you'll join the club. So we have basically monthly discussions, monthly meetups and a private members club and everything um, talking about all these topics. Um, so if you're interested in that, look forward to seeing you. And um, so that that's it. <laughs> I'll Brilliant. stop my yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, attended one of your um conscious club meetings, yeah. and it's a beautiful way for people to <clears throat> share their theories, discuss, expand. You know, remove the the um self perpetuating doubt that most people that aren't quantum mechanic physicists, astrophysicists, they don't. You know, <clears throat> you know, you came from a very educated, learned. Uh, medical background and yet here you are uh, really expertising in a subject that is largely unexplored and bringing solutions and bringing explanations that actually fit and work a module that you can easily explain so what you've done and what you've been doing over these last 25 years is create that go through the hard times with it and being mocked and laughed you're a woman you're a woman of color you're a brilliant bright brain you're gutsy, you know, all these things that you've still had to, it's so ridiculous. I still cannot believe it's 2024 and we still have to mention things like being a woman in science, being a global leader speaker in a woman's body, being a woman of color. It is just so pathetic to me. It's like we don't do this off planet. Off planet, we don't do this. We don't treat people like we treat them on this planet earth, but that's why. We have to bust all the paradigms, which is something that you are so good at. Now, your brand, punk science, it's so punk. It's so against the system. Tell us a bit about it and tell us about the movie that's coming out. Why punk science? Well, you know, as a kid, I was really into the punk movement of music. You know, so um, Sex Pistols and... In the UK at the time, and in mostly New York in the US, there was this um, really huge energy in the late seventies of um, you know rebellion and just picking up a guitar and just sort of playing it and seeing what happened. And I love that kind of energy. I was a bit young, <laughs> but uh, so I wasn't really part of that movement. But I got into it when I was a kid in the eighties, and um, when the you know, I was just sat and meditating and the whole thing just came through. Punk science with a picture of an atom of the safety pin through. And for Gen Z who don't know this, um, the punks in the late 70s used to wear safety pins and, you know, when they're going around London in their ears and in their clothes and things. And uh, it was part of that rebellion. And then it became a bit sort of cliche, so people stopped that. But um, yeah, so that's where the safety pin comes through. And it all came to me in an absolute flash. And uh, so that's, and it's perfect because I'm not an academic. I'm not an academic physicist. I'm not trained in physics. This is grassroots. You know, I'm completely freelance. I can say exactly what I want to say. You know, I'm not attached to any institution or anything. And um, so this is that same spirit of punk, just like they picked up a guitar. I'm looking into the universe and saying, this is how it is. <laughs> And uh, so we've been making a um, documentary and moving and masterclasses. Dan is in it. Um, so if you go to punksciencemovie.com uh, to find out more about that, we are now we've got the advantage of AI. We're going to the 
graphic creation is just speeding up now and uh so that'll be a whole thing as well so if you want to know about that punksciencemovie.com and I look forward to connecting with, with you on that as well brilliant <laughs> and some of the speakers that you have i mentioned i don't know what what broadcast it was this week on my channel but i mentioned that um the what the bleep do we know movie and what the bleep do we know that documentary it kicked open doors in people it kicked open conversations in quantum entanglement quantum mechanics etc and it's been so brilliant and i think we, we all went to los angeles didn't we, we were all in la at the conference um and uh, it was just quite extraordinary and um, and then it's so interesting that from that point then to the making of your movie punk science we filmed my part which was the spiritual um and you know kind of chakra like explaining some of the science the spiritual science there in 2011 we figured it out the other day didn't we that it was 2011 but you've got people like the great lynn mctaggart who wrote the great book the field i love that woman i've been trying to stalk her on linkedin but i can't get hold of her i'm trying to get her on my channel um and then uh, who else joe dispenza who since you know the early 2000s he's taken off i mean he's huge now isn't he yeah, yeah, we got they approached us actually. So Joe Dispenser's people approached us wanting to be in this project. Um and we've got Bruce Lipton, Amit Goswami, and mm. uh you know, we we've got um we've also got Professor Bernard Carr, who used to be the pupil of Stephen Hawking. Um so he's an interesting person because he's got a um a foot in both camps. He's both been in the academic science. You'll still see him appearing on um mainstream documentaries. He was on um there's an Apple documentary that was about the Enfield poltergeist. He's on that for Apple TV recently. So he's got a foot in both camps. Um so we've got people like that who are who are genuine physicists. Who and cosmologists who are also questioning reality and that side of things. We've got um, Dean Radin of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. So he's in it. So we're just so, you know, excited to bring these masters. So it's not just going to be one movie, it's going to be master classes as well and a community all based around this. So um, I'm busy getting putting all this stuff together. And um, I really, really, you know, want to release either by the um, early into next year, like hoping to get that all out because um, with AI, it's just making it so much easier to do the graphics. I know, so yeah, that's what yeah. we're looking at. Yeah, it's so amazing. Again, the advancement in technology or let's say the technology that we're finally allowed to have access to. Um, <laughs> and you, I remember years ago, the cost to be, to making the film was just beyond, it was astronomical. It was like sell a house, sell everything you have kind of thing. And now obviously we, we're moving at a much faster pace and we need to be, we need to be getting the information out that's been so stifled and stopped and uh, obstructed uh, because this film is extremely, extremely important. And the relevance of the information there, even though some of the, the parts were filmed in 2011, it's still very relevant right now, still very, yeah. very, very real right now yeah i think um you know because of the interest in science now because of the telescopes and everything um there's just a revolution and i myself am just getting a different reception because people are so much more open i can't believe this little conversations i'm having which you know a few years ago as you know um being the way that i am in the medical profession i got a lot of um hounding for my openness and uh you know so um not that I was doing anything you know it's a long story read the genius screen if you really want to know but from that era era to now it's amazing how integrated we're becoming and people are becoming so much more open yeah and it's, so it's a time yeah it is and I think it's wonderful that people can also have a confidence knowing that whatever theories they may have they can throw them into the field put them out into the mix and let's all kind of you know, study together and come up with ideas together and see what works and let go of the, the element of wanting to be famous wanting to be a big star wanting to be on a global stage it's so insignificant into the reality of really supporting humanity and we've been you know forced with this idealistic model of this is celebrity these are the gods this is god this is the king this is the whatever and that is also extremely irrelevant bye bye off you go in the bin um you know and then we realize that as a mass community as a humanity 
consciousness, loving, supportive, that we get together, we write the rules, or we decide how we're going to live as a, as a global community. And that's where we're at. And it's just beyond thrilling. You know, it's beyond thrilling. Um, and like I said to you, I'm really noticing this desperate rush for, I call it the galactic train, where people are realizing, ah, oh, well, the spiritual revolution was, you know, hijacked. And then we had people like Wayne Dyer, Jack Canfield, Tony Robbins, and they, you know, really rose to the top. Um, and now we're on this kind of galactic history, the true science of our planet that's been redacted and hidden and lied on. People like you pushing forward to the front. And like I said, with the black hole knowledge, people are desperately some, bless them, are trying to come up with their ideas and, you know, putting false information into the field. There are women, men sp who are spiritually um, casting falsities across just just making shit up and oh my client told me this when they were hypnotized that means it's true you know and it's doing such a harm because people were hungry for information we're hungry for for reality and uh and so you know the more that we do put stuff out the more that we do come together and discuss the more that we listen to people like you take your work apart look at it you know the better we can yeah. have groundedness and know what to actually believe exactly Exactly. Punk Science, if you get the book, every chapter has got all the references. Um, so this is scientifically referenced. And if I couldn't find decent references for anything that I was saying, I would cut it out. Um, there was a quote that was going around that Niels Bohr um, said, no, sorry, Max Planck said something at his Nobel speech about consciousness. I was about to put that in and then I found that I couldn't find it anywhere. It was just just nowhere. So um, that was very interesting. So I left it out. So anything that I couldn't back up, I just left out. So uh, yeah, that that's the the key. And so now what I've done is we're standing here when I've had you know I had the vision in two thousand three. So I've had over twenty years of looking at all the references, and I just need one reference to be not correct, and something might actually. The theory might actually collapse and sometimes that happens and then it turns out that i haven't read it correctly or something like that or i haven't got the full picture but i'm completely open for that to happen because that's the nature of science but so far over 20 years i've been looking at all this evidence and it just lines up to the black hole principle and the black hole principle is not something that i sat there and decided to think about you know, it's not like theoretical physics go, oh, let, let, I wonder if the universe looks like that. Let's do the mathematics and see. As in, the mass kind of looks good. Maybe this is a theory. It didn't work like that. It actually was given to me. It was downloaded. So nothing that I can do could have forced that to happen from an ego perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it came in. So I'm a custodian of it. So it's not about fame and fortune for me as it were you know it's not about me it's about being the custodian to bring it to the world right now mm -hmm. um so that's what that's about and uh yeah I just suddenly exploding people are asking me to speak everywhere again <laughs> and um uh, with this new information and uh so yeah it's it's uh it's time it's time <laughs> I love it um for those again on their kind of spiritual scientific seekers journey which I've please can we all be on that can we all be thinking and using our noggins uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. ions the institute of noetic science headed by president dean raiden r-a-d-i-n raiden raiden um and uh, fascinating man when the da vinci code book came out i loved the book the movie i was you can stuff that but the book was so fascinating and i think dan brown personally did a great job of kicking doors open in people and going hey look at these look at these ancient myths the illuminati this that and the other and now we're in 2024 and so many of what he was putting out has actually come back to be worthy of um, investigating or calling out let's say um, and then Dean Radin wrote a book off the back of the Da Vinci Code. That's how I came to know him and understand and follow the Institute of Noetic Science, which is what his book is on. And just in brief to people that have never heard of noetic science, an experiment was done on an old man. He's dying. He's given permission to be weighed the second he dies and seconds after. And the, he, they did that and they found immediately he was lighter. His soul energy frequency had left the body. I've actually seen a real soul leave a real body. So I've had my own physical 
uh, witnessing of this in real life, in real time. And Dean Radin put that um, experiment in the book. And I'm like, oh my God, this is such beautiful, noetic, again, being a Greek word, so many root words from the Greek. Uh, so guys, go and explore IOMS, Institute of Noetic Science. Uh, and thank you, Manjir, for raising that and mentioning that too, because we just need to give people a lot of different ways to get information, be part of something uh, like your brilliant science club. All right, well, let's bring this to an end, my love, and let's give your final thoughts to the audience. Well, what is this to say? So, um, yeah, just to think out the box, you know, actually... Um, uh, what are you being told in in uh, society? Question it. And uh, does this make sense to you? And uh, if it doesn't, then, you know, look further. Do your own research. Look into it. And uh, don't just take what we're given because, you know, there are agendas going on for you to think in a certain way. So, you know, do your own work. Do your own study. Do your own research into things. Brilliant. Tell us your, um, some people don't always look underneath a broadcast and then they can't remember what the website was. So can you tell us the website, the easiest way for people to get hold of you? To get hold of me, um, punkscience.com, um, paradigmrevolution.com, they both lead to the same place. The book is called Punk Science. Uh, the second book is called The Genius Groove. And as I said, the offer that I'm giving today, which includes the galactic activation, is Dr. Oz in drmangia.com forward slash Danny. We'll take you straight to it. Or if you want more information, drmangia.com forward slash GA. And uh, that's just for people that are watching this uh, YouTube channel and uh, and the punk science movie.com as well. So sign up for that. And, uh, you know, we're so excited to bring that to you at long last. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, just one thing I wanted to say about your brilliant presentation, when all of these scientists who've been in their roles and they've been funded for their work for so many different years and they're still asking for better equipment, you know, a bigger toy, a bigger telescope, maybe we should be thinking about replacing the old dead guard and bringing in the young, fresh, whether they're older, it doesn't matter, age is irrelevant, knowledge is everything that other people get a chance to put their work into the field and not be repressed. That to me would be a far better, smarter, easier um, way to go than continuing dragging the old dinosaurs by the arse behind us. Dr. Mandia Samantha Lawton, I love you, I respect you. I'm so proud to bring you back on my channel. I'm so happy that you've done what you're doing and continue to, and you're just such an inspiration to so many people. Thank you so much for sharing time with me and my beautiful audience. And to you, the audience, thank you for hanging out. Thank you for sharing your time. We really appreciate it. Love when you're in the live chat, making comments, connecting with each other. Uh, the biggest connection coming up in September is Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection, our conference. Uh, just go underneath here. You'll get to see where to buy tickets for some of the greatest speakers in the world on the planet. And until next time, I send you my love from my heart to yours. We'll see you soon.